Welcome to our session on glaucoma therapeutics and intervention. This is Toby Chen from Kitchener, Ontario, and I'm honored to be with our esteemed panel here. I would encourage everyone here in the audience, if you have any questions to the speakers anytime, please use the Q&A function in the bottom of the screen to submit them. I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Natalia Mice from the UK, presenting on her work, Incidents on Glaucoma Surgeries Related to anti vagf Injections with Supervisor Dr. Stephen Chandel. Now we know it's late evening over there, so thanks so much for joining us, Natalia. Thank you, Toby. So let me just share the screen here with you guys. And you seen it? Yep. Okay. So hello everyone. Um, I'm going to introduce to you a study that we did last year uh, in Vancouver when I was a fellow at UBC. So we did a study uh, to analyze the incidence of glaucoma surgeries related to anti-VGF injections. Uh, none of the authors have any disclosure to this presentation. And the purpose of our study was to highlight the elevated number of glaucoma surgeries that we were seeing in our clinics related to the use of anti-VGF injections in a period of 18 months from January of 16 to July of 2017 under the care of one glaucoma surgeon in Vancouver. Uh, the methods of this study was a retrospective review. So we looked back to all of our glaucoma surgeries, and we included all those patients who were having anti-VGF injections at the time of their surgeries. We excluded the patients who had new vascular glaucoma because they would need the injections for treatment of their glaucoma anyways. And we also excluded the ones that had steroid injection in any period, at any time in these 18 months. We also collected epidemiological data of these patients like age and gender, and also if they had previous diagnosis of glaucoma. We collected the number of drops, visual acuity and IOP before six and 12 months after the surgery. And more recently, we also collected the uh, change that they had in the visual fields. Our first results, we, sa we saw that we had 430 glaucoma surgeries in this period of 18 months. Of this total, almost one third of our surgeries were carried out in the context of patients who were having anti-VGF treatment. Um, and we can see here that we had different kinds of surgery, mainly trabeculectomies and tube shunts because we had very high pressures for these patients. And we thought the mix would not be the best option for them. We also had some combined surgeries. And in six of our patients, uh, we actually needed to do bilateral glaucoma surgery. Uh, we also had more main, ma uh, male than female patients, and the mean age was 75 years. And the interval between the time when we first saw them in the clinics and when they had their surgery was less than four months. So we know that it was more in an urgent basis that we had to perform these surgeries. Most of our patients were already pseudophagic at the time of the glaucoma surgery, but uh, 56 were phagic, and for most of these, we performed combined surgery. Of all of our cases, one third were previously known to have glaucoma or were glaucoma suspects under treatment, but two thirds of our patients did not have any diagnosis of glaucoma or ocular hypertension before starting the treatment for, with the anti-VGF. Uh, our mean visual acuity was very similar before and after uh, the glaucoma surgery, especially because most of the at least half of these patients had combined cataract surgeries. Uh, our main intraocular pressure was close to 40, so very high numbers. And the glaucoma surgeries were very successful in dropping the, the pressure to 14 and 13 after one year. And the mean drops before the surgery were close to three and after the surgery was, were close to zero, 0 0.5 after one year. The main uh, retinal cause for anti-VGF treatment was the age-related macular degeneration in 70, more than 70% of our patients, followed by di diabetic retinopathy and then retinal vein occlusion in one case of ocular ischemic syndrome. The most commonly used anti-VGF medication was the bevacizumab, 
and that was used exclusively in 85% of our patients and in combination in another nine patients. But we also had nine patients who were using exclusively a flibrocept, and they were also in our statistics of glaucoma surgery. We also um, managed to get in 65, 64 of our patients, we managed to get at least two visual fields in an inter uh, before and after surgery uh, in an interval between one and two years. And we know that half of these patients, they had a deterioration of less than minus five, but for 19% of our patients, they had a deterioration of in between five and 15 uh, of their mean deviation in the visual fields and five of our patients had a deterioration higher than 15. We also had 28% of the patients with a positive difference that we related to either the improvement in the vision because of the cataract surgery or just um, unreliable visual fields. The conclusion of our study is that we have a surprisingly elevated rate of glaucoma surgeries in these patients having anti-VGF. And uh, even though the visual acuity has not changed significantly, we know that we need to better assess the quality of life because we saw that they are also losing visual fields. The limitation of this study is that it's a retrospective one, so we cannot assume any cause and consequence. Um, and we are also just taking, uh, just observing the patients of one glaucoma surgery, which is a reference surgeon in Vancouver. But still, to the best of our knowledge, this is a very elevated uh, rate of glaucoma surgeries and this population is increasing and we think that this is a local health issue that we need to further understand and um, further discuss. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Natalia. Now, I know uh, there are two uh, e-posters from BC as well, um, from um, Baron Sachs um, uh, in BC about the same topic. And there seems to be quite a prevalence of this going on more in BC uh, seemingly than other provinces now. Uh, how's the situation in UK, you know, now, now that you're, you're working over there? Well, I've been here for only seven months. Uh, in my uh, limited experience, we don't have that high numbers, but also I'm in a unit where we don't have a retina service. So most of the retina patients we have to refer. So that can be a bias, but from my personal experience and also like what I've been talking to other colleagues, because I've, I've brought this poster to other conferences in London as well. And here in the UK, that doesn't seem to be an issue. That's good. That's good. Now, um, there's actually a question uh, from Cody Lowe. Um, do you have any data around the total number of injections or the timing of the injections relative to their surgery? I don't have that data. When we started to do this study, we were also doing that. We, uh, Dr. Merker, and they, from the retina side of things, they were collecting the numbers of how many injections these patients had. But I, because I left, I'm not really sure where they are at right now in, in terms of collecting that data, but there was also something that the retina guys were studying. Okay, great, thank you so much. So uh, I'm gonna introduce our next speaker, Dr. James Armstrong from Western University, uh, supervisor Dr. Cindy Hanick uh, on their work on thermosensitive hydrogel as a subconjunctival black scaffold and drug depot. Thanks, James. Hello, thank you very much for the introduction and for inviting me here to speak on behalf of the team. We have no relevant conflicts of interest to disclose. So many glaucoma patients will eventually come to rely on a subconjunctival filtration bleb to lower their intraocular pressure. Filtration blebs are anatomical potential spaces created through either subconjunctival dissection and application of mitomycin C or a preoperative injection of mitomycin C. The bleb is then connected to the anterior chamber to allow excess aqueous humor to filter through the subconjunctival connective tissues and finally away into the circulatory system. Despite the use of mitomycin C, the largest problem still remains scarring in the subconjunctival tissues. This happens postoperatively due to a variety of factors, but overall, new extracellular matrix is deposited by fibroblasts and contracted by myofibroblasts. The result is new granulation and scar tissue formation that physically impedes the flow of aqueous. 
When this occurs, patients are at risk of losing intraocular pressure control and requiring a needling procedure to reopen the subconjunctival space, or in non-trivial cases, repeat glaucoma surgery. We thought a solution to this problem could be to engineer a liquid stent, an anti-scarring drug delivery vehicle that would solidify into a volume occupying scaffold after injection into the subconjunctival space, physically preventing tissue approximation and granulation tissue formation, as well as functioning as a depot drug delivery system to provide continuous exposure to anti-scarring agents over a limited post-operative period. We reasoned that the ideal liquid stent would remain liquid at room temperature for injection, but needed to transition from a solution to a gel once at temperatures greater than that of the ocular surface. So our first objective was to find a biocompatible material that we could optimize for these specific parameters. The second objective was to interact the gels with human subconjunctival fibroblasts in vitro in order to assay for any signs of associated cellular toxicity. And finally, our last objective was to load the gels with a small molecule test compound for which we chose aspirin and assess its release profile from the gels under conditions similar to the subconjunctival space. A review of the biomaterials literature led us to chitazan and beta-glycerol phosphate, or beta-GP. When in solution, long chitazan polysaccharide chains loosely intertwine, but do not bond with one another. Something like strands of spaghetti floating around. But when beta-GP is added to this solution, it acts as a thermogelling agent. Its negatively charged OH and phosphate groups engage in temperature-dependent side chain interactions with the chitazan macromolecules creating an increasing cross-linking effect as the temperature of the solution increases. And what we end up with is a well-hydrated yet firm gel matrix. Exploring the thermogelling properties of this material was accomplished through trial and error and by mixing together different amounts of chitazen and beta-GP and then incubating them at various temperatures. We used the tube inversion method to determine when samples had gelled and we were able to construct gelation time versus temperature curves for each sample a graph right here on the right, where the x-axis is the temperature that each of the samples was subjected to, and the y-axis is the time the sample took to gel at that given temperature. We found that two of our samples gelled within our ideal temperature range, which would suggest that using beta-GP concentrations between 3 and 6% produces thermogels that take anywhere between 100 seconds and 9 minutes to gel once at temperature. The ideal time could be titrated based on surgeon preference and to allow for post-injection manipulation of the gel before it sets into the shape and position desired. To assess the biocompatibility of the gels within this, with subconjunctival fibroblasts, we put samples at the bottom of cell culture wells and grew human subconjunctival fibroblasts on top. Using fibroblasts cultured in the absence of gel as control, we were able to test the effects of the gel on relative cellular metabolic activity and necrosis. Now, this graph displays the relative metabolic activity in the presence of chitazen only gels, as well as those with increasing concentrations of beta-GP. We can see that compared to control, fibroblasts tested under all thermogel compositions showed no significant differences in relative metabolic activity. This next graph shows the relative lactate dehydrogenase released under the same treatment conditions as the previous graph. LDH release was not significantly increased by the presence of any of the tested thermogel compositions. Together, these results would suggest that chitazan-based thermogels, if used in vivo, would be unlikely to exert cytotoxic effects and pose little risk for subconjunctival tissue breakdown or erosion. And we chose to load aspirin into samples of the gel as a test compound in order to assess the drug's release over time. To better mimic conditions within a bleb, we used a microfluidics perfusion system to push artificial aqueous humor through the drug-loaded thermogels at physiological rates of aqueous humor production. We then serially assayed the runoff for aspirin content to determine the percentage of total aspirin eluted from the gel over time. Looking at this cumulative release graph, we can see on the x-axis that within the first 25 milliliters of perfusate, or the amount of aqueous produced in approximately one week by humans, 10 milligrams of aspirin was initially released. Now the next 10 milligrams of aspirin took four times as long to be released, suggesting the sustained delivery of a small molecule over several weeks could be attained in vivo using this delivery system. In conclusion, we have developed an injectable thermosensitive gel that gels within a temperature range and timetable compatible with surgical workflows. Based on in vitro testing, we have determined the thermogels are biocompatible with some conjunctival fibroblasts, 
predicting a certain level of safety and biocompatibility in vivo. And finally, we have determined that the thermogel is able to retain and elute a small molecule drug over several weeks under conditions similar to the subconjunctival space. The potential future clinical utility of this liquid stent and drug delivery vehicle would be to more predictably and reliably establish enduring subconjunctival filtration blebs, reducing the requirement for needling or revision surgeries. In order for this to come to fruition, further preclinical testing is required. Now, this would involve incorporation of other wound modulating agents, such as the one you see here, in vitro dose optimization of those agents using advanced wound healing models, and finally, an animal study to assess the gel's effects on blood functionality in vivo. I'd like to thank these excellent funding sources for their support of this work, all members of the Hutnick Lab, Drs. Tenji and Gonder, as well as the Organizational Committee for putting this event together, and for everybody listening right now. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, James. Um, yeah, this is very exciting work, and I know you also have, um, your group also has a poster on, I think, a T non capsule kind of um, biomodeling uh, as well. So I think a lot of us already do blood needling, and uh, many of us actually use viscoelastic agent to maintain that subconjunctival space. So very exciting to see, you know, where this research is going to lead us to in terms of uh, clinical practice changes. So um, I would like to uh, bring up a question um, from uh, Andre Sigiato uh, about how well this a does aqueous flow uh, through this hydrogel? Yeah, that's a good question. And um, we're actually, my, my colleague Richard Zhang, is, he's going to be starting in the lab analyzing that very question. Because if it doesn't allow aqueous through, it's going to lead to increases in intraocular pressure. Now, there's only about 1.5% chitazan in these gels, so they're they're you know, 98.5% water. So I don't foresee that being a problem, but it is something we're going to test. Great. And uh, another question from Dr. Berman in Ottawa. Does the gel adhere to tissue? Hmm. So we haven't actually uh, exposed tissues to the gel yet. That would be in the, the animal studies where that would happen. Um, the cells, though, do interact well with the gel. They they actually sometimes grow better in the presence of the gel. So I, I think that this is an exceptionally biocompatible material. Great, thanks so much, James. Uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Paul Harasimovich from Montreal speaking to us on CPC in the face of COVID. Thanks, Paul. Great. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to be with uh, all our colleagues. Wish I saw you in person so I could give you a pre-COVID hug. Um, and let's talk a little bit about Micropulse. Here are some disclosures, none of which are relevant to this talk. Uh, the Micropulse laser, uh, which we've had available in Canada for a few years now, um, is a gentler version of what we would usually do in the past with cyclocryo, then we used the, uh, the G-probe. Um, usually the G-probe we keep for refractory type glaucomas. Uh, having the um, micropulse laser has permitted us to treat patients, uh, which we would have treated with other types of more perhaps uh, surgical incisional surgeries. Uh, so the micropulse is less invasive. Um, and uh, there is actually a new probe for those of you that are using uh, the G6 across Canada. It's called the P3 device. Um, it actually has, it's more concave, limbal matched, uh, so it'll be easier to use. There's a longer stem. Uh, and basically, uh, this permits us to use this earlier in the glaucoma treatment algorithm. Uh, there is a paucity, however, of published literature on the subject. There are more studies uh, being published uh, slowly. Uh, one of the first studies by Paul Chu's group, um, together with Keith Barton, um, they did uh, a comparison of the traditional transcleral diode CPC versus micropulse. They actually had, uh, they said it was non-inferior, uh, but they actually had a higher success rate uh, and zero hypotony uh, in a very small initial study. Uh, so many of us were very excited, uh, so excited in fact that some people in some countries, uh, for instance, uh, Leo Magaccio and his group in Brazil, uh, are offering uh, CPC as a first-line therapy. Uh, they say that in the area where they are, there are few medications available, um, surgery is difficult to have, um, and in 
times of COVID uh, also, uh, many of our patients, when we couldn't get to the OR, this was something that uh, we were performing for our patients. So they actually found no difference in their uh, study group between primary micropulse uh, and patients with refractory glaucoma and micropulse. And this is in Journal of Glaucoma. Um, another interesting study I found for those of our Canadian forming uh, DSEX, DMEX, and penetrating keratoplasties, uh, Price and Price have uh, published an interesting case series of patients uh, post keratoplasty that ended up doing super well uh, with micropulse. Uh, and in fact, uh, the suggestion from their group I was at a meeting was perhaps to try this before going on to tubes. Uh, because as we know, tubes can also not only damage cornea primarily, but also grafts long-term. So in our own protocol, um, depending on the patient's pigmentation, uh, so the more pigmented you are, the lighter you would want to go. So we would choose, for instance, 2,000 milliwatts in our African-Canadian population. In our Caucasians, we would go up to 2,500 milliwatts. Um, so it is micropulse, but um, we keep on sweeping. So we sweep the probe. Um, for 80 seconds usually, and often we'll do either three or four sessions uh, of 80 seconds. Um, we still atropinize our patients, and this is done uh, with either subconjunctival or subtenons anesthesia. One can do this uh, as well with retrobulbar anesthesia, uh, but uh, this definitely has let us do this procedure in our office. Uh, so pre-COVID days, patient isn't wearing their mask, uh, neither were we. I think it's a good thing that we're wearing our masks now. And now, uh, whereas before we would get prednisolone or durazole, it's really not that inflammatory. And in fact, we have more steroid responses in patients with those steroids. So now we've switched to lodoprednol. A couple of cases, a 73-year-old phacic asthmatic with uh, exophthalmia, Graves' orbitopathy, SLT not surprisingly didn't have a big effect. Pressure is 25. They're on maximum topical medical therapy. So do you really want to have a bleb in someone who's proptotic? Uh, do you want to have a tube shunt which erodes? Not really. We did micropulse. Uh, and the pressure went from 25 to 16. A patient did super well. Uh, another patient of ours who used to be highly myopic, post-RK, uh, emphysema, alpha-GAN allergy, has had SLT three times. His pressure is 23. Uh, his OCT is showing progressive RNFL loss. Uh, we see that his right eye, this is his good eye, that we're, we're wondering what should we do. Left eye, not so hot. He has a central island. You know, he's not interested in invasive glaucoma surgery. Uh, we perform uh, micropulse. And uh, because he was already on carpine, travitan, betoptic, and methazolamide, you know, the typical glaucoma treatment. Uh, and pressure went down from the 20s to the mid-teens um, as well. Uh, this is another type of regular case, an 89-year-old with exfoliative glaucoma, a vasculopath. They're not interested in glaucoma. I'm not interested in operating someone who's not interested and who's a vasculopath and has high pressures. Uh, they're count fingers, and the referring surgeon says, uh, considering fixation loss, do you think CPC, micropulse, is an alternative to filtering surgery? We say, yeah. The, the patient says, no, I don't want anything. So we add uh, pilocarpine. They come back a month later with pressure 42 now and a painful eye. Uh, and so uh, they opt to have micropulse and then it comes back down uh, to the low 20s and the patient is comfortable. So we were happy uh, with, with that result. Uh, another patient who's had two uh, filtering procedures, one with express shunt, one with Zen, has rosacea, really awful conjunctiva. You don't want to touch the conjure filter in that conjunctiva. Uh, we perform uh, micropulse laser, uh, pressure comes down from the 20s to the mid-teens, yet develops, uh, so eyes that have been operated multiple, multiple times, uh, CME, cystoid macular edema, prolonged uveitis, but after three months, the uveitis resolves, the pressure is 15. Um, so we reviewed our results of 155 eyes, uh, Tmax was 35, uh, baseline treated IOP was 26, and after treatment, uh, you know, average IOP was 19 with two medications. Uh, most of our patients, two thirds had had previous glaucoma surgery, uh, but we were curious, I look back at who had no previous glaucoma surgery. And of those that did not have previous glaucoma surgery, I was trying to think, 
why did we, we go down this thought process? They were older, uh, much older, uh, usually high myopes, patients who wanted to continue wearing contact lenses or eyes with very no visual potential or little visual potential uh, and really red, red eyes. So we did have complications, mostly steroid responders. Uh, we had tran uh, transitory hypotony and choroidal detachments, which did dissolve. Uh, resolve, uh, but uh, no long-term hypotony, uh, some uh, CME. Uh, one patient did develop a fixed dilated pupil, which never resolved, and that was concerning because he was in his young um, uh, 50s or 60s. Uh, we also had uh, one patient who had a neurotrophic ulcer, and I'll show you that uh, example. So I did look through uh, what kind of complications can be seen with micropulse, um, and uh, it has been described that up to six months uh, after patients can have a fixed dilated pupil, loss of accommodation. And of course, we do see the, this with other laser procedures, including uh, extensive PRP for um, retinal pathology as well. Um, another group uh, said, uh, this is uh, Grover Fellman's group and Godfrey uh, in Texas, uh, they, even at three months, inflammation was still present in 46% of eyes um, and vision loss of at least one line in 41% of eyes. So, you know, uh, whenever someone says light and easy, um, you know, we always learn more as we go. So the more we're doing this in, uh, in other types of eyes, it can definitely cause other side effects. This is a patient which I successfully caused a neurotrophic ulcer in. Uh, she had the procedure done right before uh, the COVID pandemic. Um, she's already on methotrexate. She's had previous two or three previous glaucoma surgeries. Um, let's look at her visual acuity. She presents with this ulcer. Hand motion, that's a success. She, was, she used to be 20-20. Uh, finally, you'll notice at the top right that she's back to 2040 after a few months of bandage contact lenses. Uh, but still, these are some of the complications that we can see. Uh, and certainly the only thing I could find in literature on neurotrophic ulcers was a case series in uh, dogs. Um, also to know, you do have options. So let's say you do have someone with a failed tube. Uh, we've published uh, three-year data now uh, on revision of those capsules which develop around tubes. So we'll excise the capsule. Usually they're mostly around Ahmed valves. Uh, we'll put an ologen uh, collagen uh, matrix implant. We'll soak it in mitomycin. We'll put it on top of the plate and then we'll sew uh, that back down. And when we look at our Kaplan Meyer survival curves, um, you know, at least in more than half of eyes at three years, we did not have to do further glaucoma surgery. So for a surgery which can last uh, you know, uh, 15 minutes, I think it's worth going on. And these are the IOPs uh, simple after uh, capsule uh, excision. So in conclusion, uh, micropulse laser decreases your IOP. Uh, definitely it's much less painful, much less inflammation. I've seen patients uh, post-op day one when they're sitting there comfortably in the chair. Usually our diode, we, see, we tell them to come back and see us in six months. Um, just so they don't uh, have the pain. Uh, complications, however, uh, are being reported more and more. We had some in our case series. They do include CME, uveitis, dilated pupils, and neurotrophic ulcers. Uh, but definitely in your high-risk patients uh, for glaucoma surgery, uh, this is something to consider. Uh, maybe we will be treating earlier. So far, I haven't done you know, primary uh, micropulse. Uh, but also think of revising the capsules on your uh, current glaucoma implants. Thank you for your attention. Great, thanks so much, Paul. Um, yeah, that makes me recall. I still have one patient, monocular patient, also uh, ended up with neurotrophic ulcer that took a long time to recover from, uh, had to use autologous serum as well. Now, uh, you know, in, in this uh, pandemic era, is there any concern with aerosolizing uh, with either the um, MP3 probe or with a G probe? Um, so far, I haven't seen any reports about AGP. Um, I know that some uh, people advocate performing micropulse on top of a gel. Um, I, I would, you know, probably if you're doing it, let's say on xylo gel, or uh, they, some people feel that having the gel between the eye um, and the probe will actually help uh, with the contact. Um, I, I don't do it that way. I would be more concerned uh, with the gel in place, um, but certainly we're using our masks. I, I'm currently not using an N95 mask when I perform this myself. Thanks, Paul.
Now, I understand there are a few questions. We're going to try to tackle them on the side. Uh, for the interest of time, I'm going to uh, lead into our next speaker, Dr. Sebastian Garnier from Montreal, uh, speaking to us on slit lamp Zen implant. Thank you, Zeb. Hi. So, uh, today I'm going to talk uh, about, uh, in these COVID times, uh, maybe, maybe you have uh, difficult access to the OR, or uh, if you don't have an OR, or you need to be uh, quite uh, uh, fast to, to get access to the OR. So, if you don't don't need your you really don't uh, you don't need to rely on it you just got to be uh, slick so slit lamp zen implantation so uh, here are my financial disclosure uh, just to mention uh, i know we're not under the authority of, uh, of the fda but uh, it's still an uh, off label use to use uh, ad externo xen implantation just to mention that so uh, how minimally invasive can uh, glaucoma surgery truly be so um, here uh, I'm going to explain to you the technique of an ab external implantation that's done at the slit lamp. So the first uh, part is uh, very similar to a needling technique where you, you would uh, inject uh, subconjunctively a, uh, a bolus of uh, mitomycin C. I usually mix it with a bit of uh, zalocaine 2% with epinephrine uh, in order to create some anesthesia. And then after a few minutes, uh, uh, five to seven minutes typically where the medication has been uh, has been uh, reabsorbed but not totally we'll go over that a bit later on uh, you uh, you get a uh, exam from the package and with a no touch technique you slide it under the conch maybe a clock hour away from your scleral entry point and uh, you aim for the interchamber the same way you would as you would do a needling under uh, a, a scleral flap when you see the tip of your needle uh, entering the entire chamber, that's when you can start to deploy the Xen implant. And as soon as you see the tip of the Xen implant uh, entering the entire chamber, you start to slowly uh, release it uh, under the conch. And that's it. You've done a 30 second glaucoma surgery. So uh, there's a, there is a learning curve to it, but for most people that are trained in glaucoma, or, uh, or comprehensive that are, uh, have a glaucoma interest and they're used to do needlings, I really believe that uh, anyone can really do this. Uh, it's nice uh, early to practice uh, uh, your hand technique and finger position by using maybe a, an older device that you, you've retrieved from the uh, DOR and just see how, how well you can mal manipulate it at the slit lamp, how you would position yourself and also how well uh, a patient needs to be exposed. Early on, uh, I thought maybe a few, uh, a few percentage of patient could, do, could tolerate this uh, or could uh, have uh, an easy access to it. But now I, I really believe that 95% of the, the patients uh, uh, can, uh, can undergo this, uh, uh, this procedure. Um, so uh, there are some technical consideration. Uh, when you do have external, uh, especially the slit lamp. So you need to visualize your target point. So the entry point is typically uh, around two to 2.5 millimeter from the limbus. You are get, target an area that's devoid of blood vessels and your conjunctival uh, entry point is a bit, uh, a bit away, maybe six to seven millimeters from the limbus, a clock hour away. Uh, the problem is if you get too far back, if you enter the conch too far back, you will end up being caught on the collar of the, uh, the, the Xen uh, inserter device. If you're too close, however, uh, it's, a, it's a potential uh, of uh, having a sidle positive uh, testing right after. Now it's, it's not uh, such a big issue. It doesn't happen often, but uh, the, usually they are self-resolved. In the worst case, you can always add a, a little stitch uh, there afterwards. Um, the other uh, technical consideration is really the fact that the Xen is loose inside the inserter. So when you're working on a vertical uh, position at the slit lamp, you first need to target uh, the, the Xen implant uh, driving under conch on a horizontal fashion. And then after when you reach your scleral entry point, that's when you uh, rotate uh, your, your wrist and fingers so that the Xen will point uh, downward, the Xen in inserter. And uh, you want to land the tip of the, uh, the needle in the entire chamber. 
Now I mentioned briefly why I was, uh, was waiting five to seven minutes. Uh, it's mostly because uh, the, the injection, you try to, mo to move it a bit posteriorly and sometimes it creates a, a quite big blab. So you want to massage it more posteriorly to, 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 to get the myomycin away from the limbus. But after a really critical amount of maybe five to seven minutes, you find a small subconch separation uh, that's going to be uh, uh, used uh, to, do, to guide your, uh, your Xen in, in per inserter. If you wait long enough uh, after, let's say, 10 minutes or more, then the whole medication will be totally absorbed. And then it's going to be a bit uh, tougher to drive uh, the, in the inserter. So that technique is very similar to, uh, to the Xen Air Ahmed technique, where uh, we saw uh, videos from Ike injecting a bit of air to make sure that there the subconch uh, dissection uh, it creates a nice plane of this section and he injects also a bit of viscoelastic to keep that space uh, open under conch and that makes the uh, exam placement uh, more uh, reliable and more consistent. So uh, the other technical consideration is that you're going backwards. So the, uh, the, the fact that you're going backwards, it's designed to be, uh, uh, to be uh, done ab interno. The first part of the, uh, the Xen is supposed to be three millimeters long because it goes under conch. If you're going backwards, that part will end up in the inter chamber. So as soon as you see the tip of the uh, Xen entering the inter chamber, that's when you want to retrieve uh, at the same time as you're injecting. So here in, a, in another example, you see the nice uh, conch uh, lift that's, uh, that's there uh, and uh, you're uh, aiming uh, downwards and uh, you want to see the tip of your needle. If you don't see the tip of the needle in the entire chamber, do not inject because you won't have a proper placement. As soon as you see this, then you start to inject and you, that's when you pull, uh, push a bit on the blue trigger from the Zen uh, device. And then you start to see the Xen deploying. And as soon as you see it deploying, you just pull back uh, slowly. You see uh, right away a bleb that, that, that is forming. You can assess uh, right at the slit lamp at the final position. Sometimes it may end up a bit too long. So you can always use a bijoutier forceps uh, to reposition the Xen. Uh, and you can, uh, you can, uh, 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 here is the example with the bijouti forceps. So if it's too long, you want to grab it just gently and pull it back. And uh, if it's too uh, too short, then you can uh, uh, you can adjust it in the same fashion. Uh, here, a gonioscopic view of the placement, and you see that uh, without any uh, any use of the gonio to implant it, you end up uh, uh, in a nice uh, in a nice location. Here, using the corner. The gonioscope, you see that the Xen tip is freely mobile under the conjunctiva. And uh, here, as you see the sidle testing, it's negative because your entry point was far enough. So the fine tuning, if it's too short, you want to make small forward traction in order to, um, uh, to uh, make the Xen slide in the interchamber. If it's too long, however, I, I'm gonna use a small lateral traction. So we, uh, we, we did a multi-centric uh, multi study to uh, to assess our result. This is the pilot study, basically. Uh, it was uh, done with me uh, and Sean Cohen and Darana Yuan. And uh, we uh, exchanged our various tips and pearls uh, early on to sort of perf uh, to, to, uh, to make this uh, technique working. And uh, at one year result, uh, we see that uh, we have very similar result to uh, what, what is published in the literature. Uh, as far as the IOP lowering, and also in the glaucoma uh, medication use after. So uh, most of the patients are, are without any meds at one year. Uh, so we have a close to 80% success at 12 months and uh, medication free at uh, 64%. What's interesting is maybe our needling rate, which is uh, around 20% at, at one year, which is lower than what, uh, what is uh, been published. So is it related to the fact that uh, the Conch, uh, subconch placement is better, it's more reliable, it's poss possible. Now, other perspective that I want to discuss is uh, really uh, in, in uh, our, our days, we want to uh, assess safety and efficacy, but also other, other factors. Uh, uh, we know that the, uh, there's a financial burden to glaucoma care in Canada and in the world, and especially in later stages where surgery uh, create, uh, takes uh, more and more of the, the, the actual uh, healthcare uh, dollar. 
uh, and if there are ways to uh, to let's say spend more uh, for less, uh, that that could be a, a way because you don't rely on an OR, you don't rely on the heavy setup of an OR. You can have a, a nice savings there. Uh, also, uh, would would you consider this an eco-friendly surgery? Uh, probably yes. Uh, if you extrapolate uh, the, the the cost of uh, of the, the carbon footprint of doing surgery from the phaco world, maybe doing a glaucoma surgery in the OR, uh, it costs the uh, same as, a, as far as ca carbon. And the, what, what struck me is that study that, that, that was uh, explaining that maybe one phaco in the OR is uh, the same uh, carbon dioxide emission as driving 500 kilometers with your car. So this is something to consider. So uh, glaucoma surgery in the office, yeah, well, you don't need to rely on the OR time. You don't need to do an urgent trap on a Friday night. Uh, uh, it's really fast. Uh, there's a paradigm shift as far as the patient. The patient, uh, uh, of course, they're scared uh, usually to have glaucoma surgery, but uh, when, uh, when you're done after 30 seconds, most patients, they say, well, that's it. And for the, the patient I've done that had surgery before, like prior trab or tube, they say, well, that's, uh, that's really probably the way of the future. There are some economic aspects to it and also the environment. So, uh, is this uh, something that we can do in the future, like Zen after Zen, maybe to titrate a bleb? Uh, we haven't had access to this uh, before. It's a potential uh, uh, venue for uh, research. I'd like to thank my, my colleagues uh, that have uh, uh, been uh, uh, doing a slit lamp Zen over the last uh, few years. And I want to con congratulate Pierre Janson, which is the first uh, comprehensive ophthalmologist to perform the exam at the slit lamp. He did it uh, a few weeks ago, and uh, we've been uh, uh, emailing and, and, and talking about his uh, early experience. And I think it's, uh, it's something that, uh, that maybe uh, is there uh, for, uh, for the future. Thank you. That's great. Thanks so much, Sam. You make it look so easy. So um, I think we'll tackle the questions at a later discussion period. I would like to uh, bring back Paul to speak to us on hydrus versus eye stands. Thanks so much. All right. Um, thank you, uh, Toby. Toby asked me kind of not, not super last minute, but someone else was supposed to speak. I don't want to hug this, but I love talking about angle surgery because I really do think, you know, the future is here now. And hopefully most of you across the country have access uh, to these devices, which, both of which are approved uh, in Canada. And I have consulted uh, and done research with both Glaucos and Ivantis, which make uh, these innovative products. Um, also, uh, one thing that we've tried, and we really find that this is amazing for teaching, so now most residents and fellows are learning uh, these techniques. We do it in 3D uh, using the Ingenuity system, and you can really have great magnification. I mean, it's amazing uh, to see the detail in the angle, so it does make a difference for us. Most of you are familiar since 2011, 2012, we've had the eye stent. And most of us though um, have switched, not everyone. Um, I still like the first generation eye stent, but eye stent inject um, is the technique uh, which is easier to learn. Uh, however, uh, we'll mention that there are some downsides to the current version, uh, but definitely we're using that uh, in our teaching center as well. So one of the first things that we do uh, based on the teaching of our uh, Toronto guru colleagues, um, Devesh uh, and Ike, I really do think that it's important to identify the collector system uh, because the eye stent is so small, you don't really, uh, you can't rely on circular flow through Schlem's canal. So we mark this because we definitely uh, move the patient's head, uh, tilt it away, have them look towards their uh, contralateral ear, uh, and then we'll come in and having those marks will help you identify where uh, the collector channels are. Uh, the other landmarks, of course, are having blood reflux uh, or having increased angle pigmentation. Uh, once we're in, um, notice here where we've had our purple mark on the cornea, uh, we're lining up with an area, and it happens to correspond in this case with an area of increased pigmentation. Uh, it's important in the current version of uh, Inject not to push too hard, uh, because you can actually over implant and notice the very nice blood uh, reflux here. I wanted to show you, so here we actually marked three collector channels uh, and this is before. Now we're sticking in our IA probe and look at how those uh, vessels blanch when we come in. So we really are reestablishing flow um, and in the future hopefully we'll know which vessels 
uh, should be targeted. And uh, I think we'll have imaging systems which will help this. Um, here, what you're looking at is a slit lamp video. Uh, and actually, you see that uh, some of these vessels are half filled. So this is aqueous pushing the red blood cells uh, against the wall of the vessel. Uh, and we're getting amazing flow. Um, and we've actually graded that flow. We've published on this. Um, and having uh, this flow uh, is actually directly correlated with your outcome. So uh, your patients that on the next day you look and you'll see red blood cells moving really fast, they usually have uh, better IOPs. We actually looked recently, this has uh, been accepted for publication. Can this work not only in open angle glaucoma, what about normal tension glaucoma? Uh, we have a great, uh, he'll be starting his residency at McGill, Ali Salimi. Uh, we looked at our normal tension glaucoma patients and from an average of 15.2, these were FACO with two uh, eye stents. Uh, we had at one year pressures of 11.6, so below 12, which is kind of the target that we're going for. Uh, so I think even in normal tension glaucoma, and patients actually had a 62% medication decrease. Um, and so definitely we're using this also in our normal tensive glaucoma population that are presenting with cataracts. What about angle closure? This patient has mixed mechanism glaucoma. Notice the increased uh, pigmentation of the TM. Uh, that's because the huge lens has been rubbing against the iris pigment epithelium, but also they have really broad PAS, 360 PAS, and we're performing goniosiniki lysis. Once you've opened that angle, and you know the rest of the angle is full of pigment, uh, you can put in your two inject. And we also recently with uh, Ali, with Dr. Salimi, uh, looked into um, our results and uh, patients with PAC and PAC-G, and compared to cataract extraction only, uh, we have lower IOP uh, and less medications at one year. Um, so we're using it in this population as well. The hydrus is a much larger stent. Uh, once you put it in, it's uh, about three clock hours uh, in length. And it actually has a triple mechanism. Number one, it helps fluid enter canal. You also scaffold the canal to prevent it from collapsing. And also these three windows, which are located here, uh, permit the aqueous to enter um, and also egress through that way. So um, a little different in terms of mechanism. Here we performed an OCT uh, anterior segment. We see that it's well dilated. Um, the technique is... Um, also, I wouldn't say very difficult. We taught our fellow, he did our first um, this week, and we roll this in, it has a very nice design. Everyone could do their little little dance right now. Um, and this implant is now entering through trabecular meshwork. And this is what it looks like in proper position. You should have about only one third of that inlet sticking in the anterior chamber. So which one is better, the hydrus microstent or two trabecular uh, bypass stents? We actually were involved, uh, as was Ike. He was a lead author on this, the COMPARE study. Uh, in the COMPARE study, 75 patients were randomized to either hydrus and 77 received two eye stents. And this was not with FACO. These were mostly patients, uh, one third were pseudophagic and actually two thirds were phacic patients. Uh, and they had moderate glaucoma. Um, and in the end, um, at all time points over a two-year period, the hydrus had lower pressure. Um, and also when we look at number of medications, more patients were off uh, completely medications in the hydrus group uh, versus the two eye stent group. And more patients uh, required three meds in the eye stent group versus the hydrus group. Um, Reoperations for glaucoma in the ensuing two years after surgery was also higher in the eye stent group versus the hydrus group. Um, so definitely complications can happen with any of these devices. Here we see uh, large PAS granulomas forming over the eye stent. Um, but I think larger devices such as the hydrus are more prone to developing PAS, especially in narrow angles. And here we see a large PAS uh, over uh, the hydrus. Um, I do think that size matters. Look at how thin this trabecular meshwork is and we're putting in a slightly large implant into this area here. Uh, and that's why sometimes, excuse me, uh, the implant does not go into proper position and that's why it's sticking out in the anterior chamber. I do think that some patients, canal is very small and you can't get in a large device. The opposite is true, however, if you have a very large canal, the eye stent inject can go in so deep that you can actually lose it. Here where we've almost lost the eye stent inferiorly in this image. Uh, this is a proper inject. Uh, we're looking forward to the eye stent W, which has a much wider flange, should be available in Canada end of 2020, early 2021. 
So um, in conclusion, uh, both devices are excellent to lower IOP by improving natural outflow. So we're not going into an unnatural space. We're not going under the conjunctiva. Uh, patients in general, I think, require a lower target intraocular pressure or are allergic to many medications. I would probably favor more going with the hydrus than uh, with the eye stent, but it also depends on the size of their canal. I'm definitely convinced even some patients, the first generation eye stent, are, uh, if you have someone with a small canal, it can't even get in there. So the larger the canal, the more likely I am to use the uh, hydrus as well. Um, and because there are more PAS in my hand, uh, that I've noticed uh, forming with the hydrus implant. Um, for now, I'm using it in angle closure glaucoma once I've opened the angle, uh, uh, mostly with uh, the eye stent. And hopefully these hints will be useful um, in your practice. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Paul. Uh, I'm really excited to try it out. And yeah, certainly it'll be interesting to compare it with uh, the second, genera uh, second generation uh, G2 eye stent. So um, next I'd like to introduce Ike. Um, actually, he doesn't need any introduction. Um, I hope he's still here uh, to speak to us on pressor flow micro shunts. Thanks, Ike. Hey, thanks, Toby. Congratulations on, on a great job putting together this virtual glaucoma symposium throughout the meeting. So congrats to you. I know this is uh, very unusual. And so far, I think it's been great. So my job today is to speak about pressor flow micro shunt. I do consult with the company as well as the other companies that have uh, been presented here as well. And this is a device, as an ab external device. You can see it's designed with a 70 micron lumen. I'll speak to this in a second here. Eight millimeter in length, and there's a fin that's basically located in the midpoint of the tube itself. Um, one of the things, of course, important with these valveless tubes is controlling resistance to control IOP. And this is basically titrated to accept a pressure of around six or so millimeters of mercury, assuming normal aqueous production at around 2.5 microliters per minute. One of the uh, secret sauces of this is the sieve material, the polystyrene block as, a, as opposed to silicone or polyurethane. These are very stable compounds. Very little degradation occurs with these products uh, compared to some of the other devices. And this may lead to less chronic inflammation, uh, certainly in the cardiovascular, which has been used successfully to coat stents. This is showing some histopath, showing a difference in the, uh, in the relative reaction around the device comparing to silicone showing again the less inflammatory uh, reaction to this material, which we know in glaucoma surgery is certainly an important aspect to successful bleb surgery. This is just a very brief video showing the insertion uh, through the sclera, uh, and you can see how we're basically making a tunnel uh, that is um, two millimeters uh, from, three millimeters from the limbus, and the fin basically is tucked into that scleral opening here, allowing it to secure itself nicely. The tenons and conjunctiva is closed over the implant, and basically this creates a nice push here of bleb, uh, similar, of course, a mechanism to other bleb surgeries. I'm gonna share with you three studies. One is the FDA study, which is a 500 patient study, trabeculectomy versus preser flow, with mitomycin being used in both groups, 0.2 milligrams per cc. This is the study group, fi over 500 patients, randomized in a three to one ratio, and you can see some of the uh, variables here. On average, you can see the mean deviation was minus 12 in both groups, a fairly advanced group with three medications on average, Average pressure was around 21 in both groups. When we look at the study population overall, we see 70% of patients with, with trabeculectomy versus 53% in microshunt basically reach the 20% reduction. The trabeculectomy was superior, as you can see, compared to both uh, the, the uh, pressure flow, both for overall as well as greater than 21 minutes of mercury. However, both devices showed uh, pressure lowering in this population. IOP, as you can see, also a difference. IOP lowering was uh, significant in both groups. Uh, as you can see, comparing microshunt to trabeculectomy. Uh, the difference was significant, however, in favor of trabeculectomy here, as you can see in this graph. Medication use significantly lower in both groups, as you can see here. Uh, majority of patients were medication-free, as you can see here. 71% in the microshunt group, 84% or so in the trabeculectomy group. Uh, looking at adverse events, you can see endothelial you know, cell loss over to the right was actually uh, similar in both groups perhaps a bit less in the microshunt group, uh, looking at other uh, adverse events that are written here as well. Overall, you can see a persistent hypotony was less in microshunt versus trabeculectomy. And overall, post-op interventions were less in microshunt versus trabeculectomy here, comparatively speaking. There was no reports of endophthalmitis. And basically summarizing the FDA data here, we can see that overall 53% of patients achieved 20% reduction, 
with uh, microshunt compared to uh, trabeculectomy. The uh, adverse events were fairly uh, non-serious and were less interventions in the microshunt group compared to trabeculectomy. This is a publication that we just published from our group looking at intermediate outcomes. Uh, you can see in this study group here, we have about uh, over 140 patients or so in this group here. Relatively young, Caucasian, high medications on average of four, uh, advanced disease, many were pseudophagic as well, and we had a variety of mitomycin dosing as well that was present here. The IOP results you can see here, significant lowering. I think we got a bit lower than was found in the FDA study, running around 13 millimeters of mercury. Uh, this is non-comparative, of course, and glaucoma medication you can see between blue, which is pre-op, and red, which is post-op. Again, 75% of patients did not require medications post-operatively. The scatter graph probably informs us the most as far as individual patients in terms of how they do. In red, you see medication-free patients and how they compare from pre-op to post-op. As you can see, the differences here with the microstrength group, majority of these patients were well-controlled post-operatively. These are Kaplan-Meier curves, 14, 6 to 14, 6 to 17, and 6 to 21. And you can see the relative uh, differences, complete success you can see here uh, written on the top row and relative qualified success on the lower row. And you can see the difference uh, in here, outcomes here. Fairly high success rate, I would say, for both groups present, although there is some lock last of complete success as we get a, as an approach to 12 month postoperatively. Uh, looking at some of the hazard ratios in terms of success, we found one of the thing, one of the variables that seems to relate to success was using a higher dose mitomycin. And this may also relate to perhaps why our results may be a little bit different than what we still seen in the FDA. Uh, patients who received 0.4 to 0.5 milligrams per cc had a better success than those that had less than 0.4 milligrams per cc. Postoperative interventions, as you can see here, needling was done in 8.5%, significantly lower than some of the other subcosmic procedures that we see. Overall, there wasn't a lot of serious interventions required for our patients. Uh, fortunately, both early and late complications were rare. Two patients had corneal decompensation that had pre-existing corneal pathology. Otherwise, there was no real serious complications in this group uh, present. Postoperative interventions and revisions, you can see two patients required revisions, one patient required a bearable implant, but the majority out of 164 did not require any further intervention. And just a couple of pictures looking at these blebs, they're very diffuse, the morphology is quite favorable as we can see. Even when we get low pressures, we see rarely do we see very avascular blebs, which I think is one of the advantages with the posterior filtration and our comfort level, for example, using contact lenses also, I think, provides some value. We've been comfortable in some cases when we need to, to also go inferiorly as well if needed, and that maybe puts some benefit for certain patients. One of the differences, perhaps, between some of the devices is postoperative IOP stability. And these graphs show trabeculectomy on the left, Zen in the middle, and in focus on the right, pressure flow on the right. And you can see the differences in these patients, 100, over 100 patients in each group. And you can see how stable these pressures are in the first few months postoperatively compared to trabeculectomy or Zen. This reduces the amount of interventions and variability postoperatively in the early postoperative period, and also improves visual recovery. Uh, typically, the uh, microshunt patients uh, recovered faster and more completely than trabeculectomy. Just finally, we'll just show some data from our refractory study. These are patients who had previous glaucoma surgery, uh, subconjunctival surgery of any form, trabeculectomy or tube shunt. And you can see that they were quite advanced. Pressures were 22 on average of four medications. Pressures were reduced down from about 24 down to about 13 and a half, a postoperative month 12. And you can see the Kaplan-Meier curve, not as, not as great as virginized, but still pretty reasonable considering the challenging cases that we're seeing here at about 80% qualified success at 12 months for pressures between six to 17. So why pressure flow? Well, we seem to get a pressure target to roughly around 13 millimeters of mercury. We have protection from hypotony. Uh, we can use higher mitomycin dosing because I think of the protection from that and the bleb formation that is more favorable. Uh, there's good control of pressure intraoperatively and postoperatively, a more consistent postoperative recovery and a fast return to vision. Uh, I like to call this kind of a trab that's like a tube, but perhaps better. And of course, this is still in early phases and we still look forward to more data and more long-term results with the Preserflow Microshunt. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ike. Uh, so just a reminder for everyone, this is what's used to be called in focus. And I think I speak for everyone in, in the audience. We can't wait to get our hands on this to try it out. Uh, so we'll get back to the questions a little bit later. I'd like to introduce uh, Patrick Gui from Calgary to speak to us on GAD and how to make it beat other mix. Thanks, Patrick. Hi, Toby. Thanks so much for having me. I'm just getting my presentation 
loaded up there and uh, it's a real privilege to be uh, part of this uh, esteemed panel. So uh, I'll be speaking on GAT, which is Gonioscopy Assisted Transluminal Trabeculotomy. Um, here's my disclosures. Oh, hang on a sec. Here's my disclosures. Um, and uh, GAT was originally described by uh, Dr. Grover and his team in Texas around 2014. And originally it's a 360 degree ad internal trabeculotomy um, that bypasses re resistance of the trabecular meshwork uh, using the um, eye track catheter from uh, Alex. It's an off label procedure. And you can also perform it with a 4.0 to 6.0 polypropylene suture um, or nylon suture, which is also off label. Um, when performed with a suture, it's a potentially very cost effective mix option. And uh, it's conjunctival sparing, it doesn't form any uh, bled, and it can be performed with or without cataract surgery. Uh, there's a GAT equipment list. Uh, the main thing is uh, you do need uh, micro graspers and in instrumentation uh, from, uh, 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 for example, the MSCT 23 gauge micro graspers. One surgical pearl is when cannulating um, uh, a Schlem's canal with either the catheter uh, or uh, the suture, you do want to make a 100 to 110 degree um, angle between uh, the straight part of the suture and your micro graspers so, uh, so that uh, you cannulate easily without the uh, tips engaging angle structures and, and causing an inadvertent cyclodialysis or um, iridodialysis. So we'll just show you what it's about. So uh, here you can see low temperature cautery, um, smoothens the tip to make a round nose uh, kind of mini mushroom. And that facilitates advancement through Schlem's canal. That's really, really important. Uh, for right hand dominant surgeons, uh, insert the uh, uh, suture through the right paracentesis. And we tilt the microscope with uh, OVD as a coupling agent. And uh, uh, the next step is doing an initial goniotomy. Uh, which is done with a 25 gauge uh, hypodermic needle. And the goniotomy just needs to be done for about one clock hour. Uh, pressurizing the anterior chamber with heel on five does prevent heme reflux, so you can maintain your view. And then micrograspers uh, are manipulated through the temporal wound uh, to cannulate the suture and advance it in the Schlem's canal. And if you're advancing at about one millimeter at a time, it takes about 40 of those motions to go 360 degrees. Uh, unfortunately, advancing the last 180 degrees has more resistance than uh, the first 180. And you can see that we've come full circle. Uh, so uh, one uses the micro graspers to uh, retrieve the leading edge of the suture and externalize it through the temporal uh, incision. And after that step, applying tension externally on both uh, the leading and trailing end uh, uh, creates the goniotomy or the internal trabeculotomy that bypasses resistance uh, through the trabecular meshwork. The best data out there is by Grover's team, the guys who invented it. Uh, they have 24 month data that they published in around uh, 2018. And uh, of note, I mean, preoperatively, uh, uh, IOP, uh, depending on which group, ranged from the high uh, 20s. Uh, Post operatively, they got it down to around uh, the mid teens and on less medications. Uh, most common complication with GAT or, or any um, trabecular excising procedure is hyphema, so up to 37%. Um, the, you can get cyclodialysis and iridodialysis uh, and, and, and recurrent hyphema. In terms of failures, depending on the group, uh, uh, they had up to a 48% failure. And in, in, in particular, that was in the primary open angle glaucoma with uh, prior cataract extraction. Uh, so here they had 48% failures and reops in about 43%. Uh, and they felt uh, in general, these patients were older and uh, with more advanced disease since they had a, a worse on average mean deviation. So uh, they had uh, a lower IOP targets and, and therefore a lower threshold uh, for, for reops. Now, I guess the big question is, is there anything that we can do to improve uh, the GAT technique? Uh, and some of the modifications uh, that have come up is uh, doing a hemi-GAT where we unroof 180 degrees at a time. Uh, theoretically, that might save more um, half of the trabecular meshwork for future therapies, such as uh, stem cell therapy. 
and it can also reduce complications uh, such as uh, high FEMA, which uh, was uh, seen in up to around 50% of patients. And um, in addition, uh, since we're unroofing Schlem's canal, um, uh, we'll, we'll also discuss about um, evaluation and treatment of the post-trabecular outflow system uh, in the form of tracers and, and venoplasty. Uh, so here's a video for a hemigat. So we've cannulated Schlem's canal and we, we're advancing the fibrocrolin uh, suture. And basically, uh, after 20 advancements, you notice there's uh, more bowing with each um, uh, with each manipulation. So that means we've kind of seated the suture about 180 degrees and we walk the dog by grasping the suture at the goniotomy site, advancing it and pulling centrally. And this stores tension in the suture, uh, which is released by performing a 90 to 100 degree uh, trabeculotomy. So that does half of the work. And for the other half, we do a ripcord technique where we grab the suture and externalize it via the temporal wound. Now, th this hemigap technique works well for the fibroproline suture um, because it's the right combination of thickness and stiffness. Uh, if you're using the um, a 6-0 proline suture or the eye track, uh, sometimes those are too small, so uh, the suture just pulls out. Uh, the original um, uh, tracer uh, was actually a uh, uh, BSS described by Grover, and here we see um, the BSS infusion at the end blanches the inferior treated 180 degrees. So we kind of get a hemi episclerovenous fluid wave. Um, the untreated area uh, where the superior episcleral veins are, uh, are still prominent um, is seen over here and it's more injected. Uh, however, uh, by hyperinflating uh, the anterior chamber again, we get a repeat episclerovenous fluid wave and we actually get 360 degree uh, blanching. So uh, th therefore you kind of get a, a 360 degree treatment and blanching, even though we only uh, uh, did a hemigat on the inferior 180 degrees on the right. And uh, finally, tripen blue uh, can also be injected uh, uh, and I'll, I'll just, for the sake of time, we're gonna speed this up. But this is a, a technique using the eye catheter. And, and basically, um, we pr prime the catheter with the tripen blue OVD mixture. And in real time, we're injecting uh, the tripen blue and OVD mixture into the um, Schlem's canal in the post-trabecular uh, outflow system. And so this is giving a, a real-time uh, tailored uh, uh, venography um, uh, of the patient. And, um, and uh, the interesting thing is uh, we're, we're getting quite uh, a heterogeneous appearance uh, to the venographic patterns, much more than we expected. And for the sake of time, we'll, we'll just, uh, we'll skip this, but this is just uh, EBIC with uh, using um, OVD, uh, the original tracer. But in some patients, you could uh, get a demonstration of pulsatile aqueous outflow. And, and finally, uh, you don't need to get too fancy uh, with these uh, venoplasties and tracers. You, at the end of the day, you can just use uh, the OVD cannula to power wash or visco uh, dilate the collector channels. So in summary, uh, uh, GATS, we've had success in a number of stages uh, uh, and different mechanisms. Um, uh, contraindications are, um, I would not recommend it with uh, any combined complex anterior segment or parse plane of vitrectomy uh, surgery uh, or angle supported ACI law. Uh, this really uh, increases the risk of high FEMA. And uh, uh, the future directions are to further optimize the extent of the goniotomy and investigate the use of uh, the tracers. And uh, thank you very much for your time. Thanks so much, Patrick. And uh, for everyone, uh, please don't forget to check out the surgical video section in the virtual lobby. There's also a pretty good video from Patrick uh, on GAT there as well. So last, I'd like to bring Ike back to uh, help us navigate through all these options and uh, shine some light on uh, um, you know, the uh, glaucoma treatment algorithm amongst all these different options. So thanks so much, Ike. Well, thanks, Toby, for asking me to uh, summarize things. And I, I labeled this uh, treatment algorithm, what do we do? We're looking for guidance from above uh, in terms of how to use all these things. Of course, they're exciting and new, but do we have enough information to guide us in terms of the next approach? And these are my disclosures again. My, my, one of my disclosures I should mention again, I have a strong bias against red eyes and angry eyes. 
I think we need to kind of, you know, base our foundation and treatment, uh, moving away from looking at IOP only and medication use, but really talking about the quality of life for our patients. And not just about the disease-related quality of life, but the treatment-related quality of life. We know, of course, that drops and other factors, including major surgery, can impact quality of life, sometimes in a negative way. And this has to be a guiding principle for us, along with uh, cost-effectiveness as well, that our payers need to consider. You know, topical glaucoma therapy and quality of life have been, have been looked at. We need to probably look at it in more detail, but we do know subjectively and objectively as well the impact of surface medications on patients. And these are sometimes some of the uh, decision-making variables in terms of choosing a procedure or not. Uh, compliance, adherence remain a major, major opportunity to improve, major problem. Uh, adherence uh, and poor adherence is very common and has been associated with progression in a variety of studies, including the recently published CISIS trial, uh, which I think really did show uh, the uh, relationship between uh, missing doses and progression. And this is just a reality for many of our patients. And so I think we have a couple of groups that we need to really address as we think about algorithms. One are the patients who are mild to moderate, who are not in terrible shape, but they face quality of life and adherence issues and risk in the long run. And patients who have more moderate to advanced disease that were a little bit reluctant moving over to do the big heavy hitter trabeculectomy and is there something else we can provide for those patients? This kind of leads into the interventional glaucoma theme. Generally speaking, we, we are kind of we've been advocating lowering pressure, uh, perhaps more so than historical, doing it earlier, doing it safer, and addressing adherence. This is kind of the holy grail in the interventional concept. This kind of is some of, these are some of the underpinning concepts for MIGS, of course, as well that uh, we've seen on display earlier today as well in terms of some of the principles that MIGS would would, would share. So what, what's the proposed surgical algorithm? We have a lot of options. We've heard many of these as well. We can divide them up between, between MIGS. And for now, MIGS basically is localized to trabecular mesh, Rochem's canal. Uh, Supercordial space was available, not anymore. Uh, and so that's still on hold. Uh, bleb forming procedures, we have a list of them here. Some of them are traditional, some of them are new. And we've heard some of them today. And also we have cyclobladed, we heard as well, including new micropulse. These are all new options or old options, I should say as well. This is a busy slide. This is the AGS position paper published in our journal, Ophthalmology Glaucoma, this year, which divides up MIGs and traditional filtering surgery, uh, divides them up between non bleb forming and bleb forming, uh, supercoidal space, inflow and outflow. Uh, and you can see how they're all divided up here trabecular meshwork, uh, whether they're implants, whether they're excisions or dilation procedures. Traditional surgery can be done ab external bleb forming or with plates. Uh, and again, we see some examples present here if the implants are placed externally. This kind of is what divides traditional surgery from ab internal MIG surgeries in general. There are a lot of options we have available to us, uh, and we've heard some of them already here today, and it's kind of a dizzying amount of options available. Uh, they're mostly available in Canada, except for a few here, including Preserflow and ELT not being available. Um, however, the bigger problem is more access, of course, in terms of reimbursement, funding for our hospitals and our systems, which are currently uh, not universally available. So the, we can think about these options in terms of medication alternatives and like MIGs and tr truly, truly procedures that are designed to lower pressure at a very low level. Um, we can think about, the, again, the outflow track that we're trying to uh, uh, facilitate, whether SEMS canal or supercoroidal or subconjunctival, and those are ways we can divide things up. The, the first thing I will say when I have a patient in my office and in my chair or virtually I always ask myself for any glaucoma patient, I teach the fellows this, I need to ask myself, or at least at the end of that conversation or examination, is my patient controlled? That's the single most important thing I wanna know, at least as much as we can, as we make a decision whether we need to do anything further or not. What does controlled glaucoma mean? Well, to me, it means a peak pressure that's at or below target. Target is based on consensus on guidelines and individualized. I'd like to have the evidence that the patient has stability of the visual field and OCT over two plus years. That would give me a, a feeling of control and that the patient's adherent and they're tolerating therapy. So that's kind of to me what control means. If they don't meet these things, then I certainly have to consider the patient may not be controlled. And what do we do next? Well, what do we do next if they're not controlled? We can continue to observe. We can have more meds. We can do SLT laser. We can do bleb surgery or we can do mixed surgeries. And those are some of the options available to us. So if they're not controlled, the next thing I ask myself is, does this patient need a bleb? As a glaucoma specialist, I do bleb surgery, and I need to know whether I need to bring out the big guns for this patient. So first, are they controlled or not? Secondly, do they need a bleb or not? And that'll guide me to the next step. Of course, 
The question is, does my patient need a, low, a lower pressure a down, to, down to around 12 or lower? That again tells me again and guides me in my approach. We of course have old and new subconjunctival surgeries, uh, traditional treps, uh, trabeculectomy surgery, tube shunts, and of course, we now have microstents and microstents available that all basically uh, are designed to, to promote subconjunctival filtration. Traditional surgery is powerful. It, it's quite effective. Uh, this is from the SIGIS trial, and you can see the average pressures are around just under 15 uh, over five years. Uh, if you recall the, uh, the pressure flow study I showed, FDA study actually had pressures at one year at about 11.4 or so. So trabeculectomy is the king when it comes to pressure lowering. I don't think anybody has been able to knock that procedure off yet. However, there are traditional surgical issues that we have with these approaches. Bleb related, hypotony related, variability in healing. These are all of course things that make us hesitate prior to jumping in and doing these procedures as effective as they may be. So trabeculectomy, powerful surgeries. We have a in more intense and lengthy post-operative course and intensity. We have other bleb related issues that may occur. They're rare nowadays, but they can happen and it can impact quality of life as well. This is where subcon surgery has come on in terms of mixed procedures. They do have more power than mixed surgeries, they less intensity, but it's still a bleb. Uh, not as lowering as pressure lowering as a trabeculectomy, but they have more potency than typically we see from the mixed procedures. And the questions are, of course, are there less complications? Is there smoother recovery? And of course, we have some early data to support this. More has to come forward on this. And of course, we've we have we've heard both Zen and Pressure Flow, formerly known by the way as InFocus. And don't ask me why the name was changed. It wasn't necessarily my idea. Now, second part is, does my patient need a pressure in the mid-teens and or, and or on less, less medications? This is different than the patient needs a bleb. Uh, and this will guide us potentially to looking into the trabecular conventional outflow system, which we know has, a, of course, a, a limiter that will prevent hypotony from occurring. And we have a variety of options. Patrick showed some nice videos, as did Paul as well, and, and others here uh, showing otomy techniques, high-tech or low-tech stenting approaches, laser approaches, ablative approaches, all basically doing the same thing. They're all designed to basically enhance aqueous outflow through the conventional system uh, and can be considered in different ways, whether, again, they're dilating, stenting, or, or cutting approaches. And that's a, a broad way to look at it, but they all are trying to do this. They're trying to get aqueous into that distal outflow uh, tree. Um, of course, they're, they are, they're very safe. The question is, are they effective enough? They're physiologic, but they have a limitation as far as how low they can go, and there's a fair amount of variability with patient response present as well. And the other thing to consider, of course, with glaucoma surgery is what about the consideration of combined cataract surgery uh, and versus standalone? This does guide us as well, because if we're doing cataract surgery on a patient with glaucoma, we introduce the concept that should we be doing glaucoma surgery for them as well, even if they're controlled for, uh, for reasons other than simply pressure lowering, but also for potentially um, uh, you know, quality of life. So usually there's a balance between efficacy and safety. Usually we gain something, we lose something. We gain efficacy, we lose safety. We gain safety, we lose efficacy. And this is a classic example between TRABS and MIGS. There's a tug of war, right, between trabecular meshwork and subconscious procedures. You know, we, get, we go safety on one side, we have efficacy on the other side, and can we get the best of both worlds is obviously our challenge. And each of these procedures have a certain pressure target uh, that we can try to reach uh, for this. This graph kind of shows, generally speaking, IP lowering on one level and risk level on the, on the x-axis. I put medications and lasers as being maybe a little less, well, being less efficacious, but less risky than doing trabeculectomy or tube shunts. We want to be where the star is, right? Where the red star is, not the communist, but we want to be right there. We want to be basically low risk, but high efficacy. We don't have a procedure like that yet. Uh, Subcons mix gives us more efficacy, but still has some risk, uh, but not as much efficacy as trabeculectomy. And, trabe and trabecular meshric mix. Uh, do have, I think, a safer profile, but again, lack in efficacy compared to a trabeculectomy. There's a rule for all of these, I believe, in terms of patient selection, and this is basically my algorithm, and I'd like you to read it, uh, this high-tech algorithm here. So the procedure attributes in my algorithm include safety, efficacy, post-op management intensity, ease of use, speed of visual recovery, and of course, cost reimbursement is a huge player uh, in Canada and other jurisdictions as well. Some of the questions to ask us in, in the algorithm is, are we doing combined cataract surgery or not? Is our pressure controlled or not before surgery? The severity of glaucoma, medication tolerability and compliance and age, all, all factor in amongst other factors as well. These are four boxes of patients that typically we look at surgical options, combined cataract surgery. We, we can look at standalone patients that don't have cataract surgery that have a target in the mid to high teens, standalone target 12, and standalone target single digits. 
let's talk about these groups as we finish up this, uh, this conversation here. Combination cataract. I want to typically avoid cataract surgery with a bleb. Personally, I don't like it. I think these blebs don't do well when they combine. And I'd rather space them apart if I can. I want to do something as safest and least impactful to the cataract surgery. In many cases, the patient is going to surgery primarily for their cataract. Why interfere, why interfere with the refractive and their postoperative recovery? And we want something that's going to be synergy. Blebs and cataract surgery are kind of not synergetic. They're antagonistic in some ways with the inflammation occurring and the recovery. Synergy is important. And that's where I think stem canal stenting, I think, fits very well with combined cataract surgery for these reasons. Uh, very safe, minimal risk of hyphema, good synergy, visual recovery limited, um, and pressure lowering. Again, not as efficacious as bleb surgeries, but can, can often get patients on less medications. What about the patient that is not going to cataract surgery, or they already had cataract surgery, and the target's in the mid-teens? These are patients, for example, that maybe are on two, three drops, they're 78 years old, their eyes are red, they're irritated, and all we're doing is just come back in six months and continue taking your three different classes of drops. These patients, I'd rather avoid a bleb. They don't necessarily need a bleb when their pressure targets are in the mid-teens. I want something that's going to be the greatest probability of pressure lowering if I'm going to choose a mixed procedure. And I want to access, for that reason, a greater amount of collector channels. This is where abinternal trabeculotomy, Patrick showed some nice videos looking at GAT or ABIC, I think are reasonable options if we're doing standalone. Stenting could be used as well, but I think there's certainly a, a more propensity to great, gain greater access to a larger area and have a, have, a, have a discernible outcome, meaning cutting of the TM, which is less variable in terms of that, although there is some healing differences. Standalone target of 12, uh, these patients that need, need a bleb. They need a bleb because we need to get pressure lowering. But we want something maybe more predictable, less invasive, faster recovery, and we want something maybe that has better blood morphology. And this is where I think subconjunctival MIGs may have a role in this group rather than going right to trabeculectomy. And then there are patients in the single digits. Now, TRABs don't always get there, but they certainly have the greatest chance to by titrating the pressures lower in the postoperative period by suture lysis and needling. And we're willing to take the risk to get there. So that's basically a bit of an algorithm I hope I've shared with you. Certainly not complete, certainly not uh, evidence-based, and certainly an opinion. Um, I do like to go lower targets in my patients, especially if they're going to live long, if I feel they have a long life ahead of them. We don't know that, of course. Um, and they are more than mild disease. SLT for me is first line, hands down. I'm convinced of it. I already was before the life study. And I think you should be too. Again, with some exceptions. I like to escalate with power. Patients progressing and they're on one drop or SLT, I want to hit them hard to get them lower, not just a small 15% drop. If they're escalating, we need to escalate with power. Typically, it means moving to a combination drop or do something more invasive. Uh, for that reason, and issues around adherence, I think surgical options are earlier in our, in our paradigm. If they're going to cataract surgery, I like using MIGS as an ability to lower medication use compared to non, uh, just FACO alone. And we have subconscious travel surgery, which I think is an improvement. However, as we spoke about earlier, and I spoke about this earlier, TRABs are still needed. We need people who need very low pressures. And so far, we have not been able to crack that yet with a procedure that can compete at that very low level. Uh, cycloablation to me is still evolving. I, for me, it's a role that's primarily used after traditional bleb surgery. However, I do hear people, of course, using them earlier, and we look forward to more evidence-based uh, decision-making on this as well. Uh, thank you again for the invitation. I hope that was uh, helpful to give you some thoughts and maybe some more questions as well.